Good evening, everybody. Let's get a little high like a place today. Everybody join.
Ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to what feels like what should be an extraordinary day on our calendar. It's hard to believe it's just a regular Tuesday night, but the truth is, we began to have Rebbe several years ago. We began an annual event like this. COVID rudely interrupted. We were only able to have Rebbe twice. Behind the Bima, but tonight Rebbe is back on the Bima. Ron Essebag, the highest, the holiest. Thank you for lifting us. Thank you for moving us to sing and to dance. And everyone, I hope you have no plans tomorrow because we're going to sing and dance through the night. So thank you, Ron. What a schus, what a privilege it is to have Rav Weinberger Shlita back in our community. What a schus it is to be together again and to bring Rebbe's inspiration and Kedusha to our base Knesset, to our shul, and to our community. There are so many things to be grateful to Rebbe for, but tonight we want to add to that list. The Rav Weinberger and the Holy Eish Kodesh community very selflessly have agreed to share a gem, a jewel of the Jewish people. They've agreed to share Rav Yon Evan, who will be coming down, please God, as the Rosh Yeshiva, the incoming Rosh Yeshiva of the brand new Yeshiva of South Florida. And it could only happen, it could only take place with the support and with the partnership of Rav Weinberger and the Ish Kodesh community. And so for that and so much else, we're so grateful. I want to begin with Akar Satov with gratitude tonight and thank our sponsors, our supporters. Baruch Hashem, it's a long look at the flyer when you see those who have been supportive and enabled tonight's program. And so much learning in our community well beyond it. Please make sure to thank them. Very special thank you to the committee who organized and arranged tonight, led by our beloved Rabbi Ari Mirzoff. Rabbi Mirzoff, thank you for putting so much love into tonight's program. Our incredible staff, the Rabbanim have worked so hard. Jeffrey, who brought a special touch, a new member of our BRS staff, we're so happy to have on board, who worked hard for tonight, Yaakov Lupin, 
So excited to have him. Our amazing custodial staff, we're so grateful for setting up. And I missed the cue to thank Choni when he came up. But a big thank you to Choni and Choni Productions always for doing such a wonderful job. This room may be packed. This room is overflowing and full. For those who are enjoying tonight and will walk away so inspired are not only in this room. My good friend, Nachi Gordon, and the incredible organization and platform he has built, Meaningful Minute, is live streaming right now. I have no idea how many are watching, but I'm sure with his reach, it is many. And so we welcome you wherever you are in the world. Welcome to Boca Raton. Hopefully you can feel that warmth through the technology. And a big, big thank you to Nachi, to Meaningful Minute, for their partnership and sponsorship this evening. A big thank you to Start Off Studios, incredible photography, so many of our programs and events. Thank you for capturing them so that we can continue to experience and relive them over and over again. Tonight is not just the opportunity to hear from Rav Weinberger, from Rebbe, to sing and to dance, but it's a night to recognize and to pause for a moment to celebrate the extraordinary Dr. Yitzhak Belazan based Medrash of the Boca Raton Synagogue. I want to tell you why we're so proud of the vast and diverse learning opportunities that it provides and offers on so many different levels, among the many learning opportunities in the community at large, the Scholars in Residence program, and our incredible Danny Grejauer, La Shalom Midrasha, Women's Midrasha, our youth learning and programming. But I want to focus tonight, we are here to celebrate and express our appreciation to the Dr. Yitzhak Belazan based Medrash. This week's Pasha, Pasha's Yisro, not unique, but unusually is named, not for a righteous Jew, is named for a non-Jew who debated if he joined the Jewish people or not, but when he comes on the scene, Yisro is not a member of Klal Yisro, and yet a parsha in the Torah is named for him. According to many, Yisro first arrives to join the Jewish people in the desert after we receive the Torah, and yet the Torah does not go chronologically. The Rebona Shalom, when he dictated the Torah, put the story of Yisro first, and the question is why. Chaim Shmulevitz and many explain that Yisro had a critical and crucial quality. Yisro had something every one of us needed to learn from. It deserves a parsha being named for him. And if it was a prerequisite, before we can read and before we can re-experience the receiving of the Torah, we have to remember this koach, this skill, this talent. We have to remember this character trait of Yisro. Says so, Rav Chaim Shemlevitz, Yisro is the quintessential mevakesh. He's thirsty. He's curious. He's inquisitive. He wants more. He wants to grow. He's not satisfied or complacent. It's never enough. Commenting on Yisro's declaration, Ata yadati ki gadol Hashem Elohim. Now I know that Hashem is the greatest of all gods. Rashi points out, based on the Mechilta, that Yisro was well positioned to know because Yisro had studied comparative religion. He had experimented. He had worshipped. He had tried everything. And at first glance, you wonder, Yisro, such a righteous and noble person, why are we collectively speaking Lash and Hara about him? Why would we continue to commemorate that he experimented and tried every Avodah in the world? You're not supposed to remember about Shuv about their past. You're not supposed to remind them. So why are we reminding each and every year in this parsha and through Chazal and the altar of Kelm points out that in fact, it's not a G'nai. We're not disparaging Yisro, we're complimenting him. The Torah's not knocking him down, he's building him up. Torah's telling us, you know how he became a Yisro? Because he was a Mavakish. He was looking for the truth, and he wasn't satisfied until he discovered it. Others, it would have been good enough. They'd see, they saw, they experimented the other religions. But for Yisro, it wasn't enough. Hevra, my friends, this beautiful community who are here physically and who've joined us through technology globally, our aim, our aspiration... The goal of our base medrash is to be a community of mevakshim. To be people who are thirsty and who are hungry, who are searching and who are yearning, who are looking. We can't control necessarily the IQ we're born with, the memory we have. We can't control so much of our DNA, but we can control 
how hungry we are, whether we are mevakish. That's the mission of our base medrash. One of my daughters once shared with me something she had learned. Torah is compared to water. You know, water is very bland. It doesn't have a taste. Nobody slices into a juicy steak with a tall glass of water. Water is bland. It's tasteless. And yet, a person who's thirsty, coming from a run at the end of a fast day, there's nothing better or more delicious than a tall glass of water. Because water's taste is relative to the thirst that you have for it. That's Torah. If you're not hungry, if you're not thirsty, if you're not searching to feel bland, but if you're a mavakesh, if you're a mavakesh, as the Pasuk both in Tehillim and Divrei Yom, it tells us, Yismach lev mavakesh Hashem. The Chavetz Chaim says, Yismach lev. Normally when you search for something, you're only happy when you find it. Says the Chavetz Chaim, if you're a mavakesh Hashem, Yismach lev, you're happy just from the search. That is the mission of our base Medrash. Named aptly for an incredible mavakesh, Dr. Yitzchak Belazan, Zichron Levracha. I had the privilege of growing up and watching his son Avra, my dear friend, who has been a lifelong chavrusa. Dr. Belazan, Zichron Levracha, was a mavakesh. Everywhere he went, he just wanted to share Torah. A prominent, respected doctor and physician, and that might have been his career and even his calling, but who he was, his identity, was learning Torah, teaching Torah, sharing to Torah. He was mavakesh and he made others have that same bikush. And so we're so grateful tonight to Avram and Alana, to the whole Belazan family, for what you've done to promote, to share, and to spread Torah in our community. We can never express enough gratitude for the countless programs and learning opportunities for us to express our thirst and quench our thirst. The afternoon kolel, the Arab Shabbos kolel, the night seder, the visiting Rosh Hashiva series, the boys' chavrusa learning, Ovas Ubanim, the Yadrim journal that's published each year, the summer kolo, the chever who are here now in the winter kolo, and the list goes on and on. He was a mavakesh, and we are trying to be a community of mavakshim in his name. And for that, we are so indebted. Thank you so much for your generosity and leadership. I want to add our gratitude to our Rosh Beis Medrash, Rav Simcha Shabtai, Rabbi Shabtai. Thank you for all you do to organize, to lead, to coordinate, and to create the incredible learning opportunities within our community. We should continue to go mechayal achayal and see tremendous mazel and hatzlacha. Yismach lev mevakshe Hashem. For most of us, for many of us, for all of us, do we know a bigger mevakesh Hashem than Mori Verabi, than Rav Weinberger? You're lit on fire just sitting in his vicinity. It's contagious, that enthusiasm and that energy and that passion in that romantic way in which he describes a relationship with Hashem, bringing our Yahadis, our Torah, to life. Rebbe, you teach us to be thirsty, and then you quench our thirst. You teach us what it means to be a mevakesh, no matter what age, no matter what stage of life, no matter where you are or where you come from, to always remain hungry and thirsty, to yearn and to search, to look for more and more. Thank you for pushing us, and thank you for lifting us, and thank you for inspiring us on a regular basis. Kaddish Baruch Hu should continue to bless us with the opportunity to learn from you. Without any further ado, what a schus it is. Please rise and join me in welcoming Rav Weinberger Schlita. and the wonderful, wonderful Rabbanim, my Sukkis back home, Rabbi Levin, wait, wait for what you see over time, you're just beginning to see what a treasure Rosh Kodesh and, and Boker Tana sharing in our Shana. I wouldn't even use the word shuf because I, I feel that Eish Kodesh and Boker Atan, I feel that it's like we're brother and sister. I, I feel such a connection. It wasn't even a Shiloh when it came up what, what Rabbi Levin could accomplish here and I have other Talmudim who are here and I, I believe that we, we have the same dream and the same hope, the same vision. 
You know, I'm so sorry. I have to apologize. But from you were talking, I was thinking about, I don't know why it came into my head, a non-Jewish song that I used to listen to 50 years ago. <laughs> Please be mindful of me, and don't go right away and Google it. Why, just believe me, it's a, it, it was... There was a song like that that had these words, and it was from a, it came from a person who was a uh, was not was not from the Lama Bar Tzadikim. <laughs> I was thinking about how wonderful life is while you're in the world. That's what I was thinking. And I had that feeling about this entire kahila. Those who I know personally, those who I don't know personally, but what's happening here and what you're doing. All over the world, the shame tov that you have. Before all of New York picked up and moved. <laughs> and I'm so sorry if you're causing your aggravation. <laughs> you know, the old Kevra, I'm sorry. But over time, give them a chance. They, you work with them, they'll, they'll hold the door open, they'll say thank you. It, it just a little bit of time. They're really very, very good. It's just the manners are, are, are off. <laughs> they'll be okay. They'll be okay. A lot of cold winters has that effect on you. But I'm talking to a uh, Samedrish filled with warm Jews, men and women, Mavak Sheshem. And last time that I was Zarechi to be here, before all the insanity and the sadness set in, I did something which I, which I, which is a little bit uh, unconventional even by my standards, and I, I just took out my phone and I played you a song that beautiful Megan only you and some of the Hever from here have I've met over the over the, the the years I've met you in different places and a couple of times someone just starts to sing only you and I say who are you and he says I was in Boca <laughs> so we're bringing together I want to I'm not going to play a song tonight but I want to Continue this chelik base of that conversation. This is a series as long as it takes in the shim till we all go back together to Yerushalayim. We'll continue there also. This chelik base. The fabrengen. The fabrengen. Jews sit together. The greatest mashpia chabad lubavitch of this generation was of course the great tzaddik, the goyim, Rabbi Yol Khan, who passed away a short time ago, not long ago. I don't know how many of you heard of him. He's a remarkable person. I was lucky to hear many shirim from him. He was born in Russia. He came to Israel as a child. He grew up in Tel Aviv. Eventually went to Panovich, came from Lubavitch family. And then ended up coming to the Rebbe when the Rebbe was here. And then all of the years he remained in New York, the Rebbe's Chaiser, as you know, the photographic memory. I remember by the Febrengans, he'd be standing by the pole, leaning his head against the pole with his eyes closed, listening to the Rebbe. And then afterwards, he would repeat the entire four hour, three, four hour Sicha, word for word. So he sometimes spoke about the interesting people that he knew in Tel Aviv. Tel Aviv is a very colorful, colorful city. We don't know what it was like. 50, 60, 70 years ago, it was very different than it is now. There were many Rebbes there and great people. Particularly with the rest of the Chavra, there were a lot of Bat Midrashim, Tzadikim. And Rabbi Yol spoke once about an interesting character who he said was one of the biggest maskilim in Chassidus. A very, very profound thinker. A deep thinker in Chassidus and Kabbalah. His name is Reb Zalman Moshe Yitzchaki. Zichron Levach. In Chabad, they don't make a big deal about uh, people and titles. Reb Yerl himself walked around with his shirt out and you know, would go into a bakery to get a, a Danish. That's how it was. And this, this person was a, a Jew that knew all of Shas, Bavli, Yerusham, Chassidus, Kabbalah. And he used to oftentimes just walk up and down the streets thinking, chazring over a mimer of the Rebbe. At that time, it was the Friedrich Rebbe. 
and and one day he was walking down Tel Aviv. Rabbi El said, and he was saying over and over and over again the words "Ein od Mulvad," which is only you, only you, Hashem, only you. And he was saying these words "Ein od Mulvad." There was a maimer by the Rebbe, and he was. He was walking on the block, Rabbi El said, and there was a, a little boy that was playing by himself by the name of Mordechai. Mordechai. And the and Rabbi Zalman Maisha said, Mordechai, I need you. Could you come with me just for a few minutes? And he said, sure. And he sat down. Now, don't, you can't do this in 2021, Tavshin Pei Bay, uh, 22. You can't do this. He took out a bottle of schnapps, Lubavitcher. He took out a bottle of vodka and he took two cups and he poured one for himself and one for eight-year-old Mordechai. <laughs> two cups. And you know, in Lubavitch, they don't have glazeloch. You know what I mean? They have cups. And he poured two cups of vodka and he said, Mordechai, I need you. I'm working on this. I'm working on this so much that I can't unless I feel right with somebody. So if we could fabrang together, is that okay? And the little boy said, sure. So he said, look, you're, you're only eight years old. You're not allowed to drink yet. I guess like in a year or so, but not now. <laughs> you're not allowed to drink yet. So I'm going to drink your cup also. <laughs> I'm just, it's for you, but I'm going to be like you. you know, I'll be might see you. With and the little boy told this story, and the girl said it over that he sat there with, Reb, with Reb Zalman Maisha, for six hours singing and when and Reb Zalman Moshe said he said oh the uh, Hezbra a, a parish on the on the Maimba of the Fidik Rebbe on some Maimba on these words Einod Mulvad there's only you Hashem and Rabbi Yol, Rabbi Yol asked like what's the story with this little boy it's amazing that he sat there like that he didn't understand at all what the Tzaddik was talking about Kabbalah, Chsidus, whatever. And he's in the middle of his little game. So Rabbi Yol said that without the oil, without the chavra, without the chsidim, without the friends, one can't bring that truth of Ein Od Mavada to the deepest part of oneself. And he didn't have it, but he was, uh, was busy. So he took little Mordechai, another Jew, and he felt burned with him. I didn't come here, Chavre, to say a shir. There are a lot of shirum. I give a lot of shirum. I didn't come here to. I didn't. I didn't travel from New York and have to put that stupid thing on my face for four hours this morning, so I can give you a shir. You can listen on tape to the shirum. I came to Febrin with friends of mine. Some I know, some I don't know because of my great love for your Rav and the Rebbeim here, and because I'm so excited for Rabbi Levin, for my dear friend Rabbi Yoni being here, and for families I know here, my Talmud, Rabbi Sadiq, the Yeshiva, Rabbi Ari, Rabbi Ari, and other chevr that I have here, to bring together with you, to continue with Chelek Beis of what I spoke about a few years ago, Einod Movado. So let me talk to you a little bit about what the Rav was saying a minute ago. A little bit to explain. But again, by way of bringing you together, not by way of teaching you something or a class or a lesson. You have fantastic teachers. You don't need me at all. But you're bringing a little bit. Without the vodka. But we're bringing a little bit. It is a big question. And this is what the Rav is talking about. There's a question that's asked by the Maral and Gerarye. It's asked by Mizrahi. By the Mepharshim. By Yishma Yisrael that Yisro, Yisro heard. Kriyas Yamsuf, Mechamas Amalek, Kriyas Yamsuf, he heard some great stories. It's called Asher Osa, Lekim, Lemayishu, Yisro, Lamay. Kihoyitzi Hashem, it's something that's right. So he heard... He heard these Gewaldige Meisim. And as the 
I've explained, he was a big mavakish. That's why he was looking at every other desire in the world. They were great people. They were looking. They were looking for the truth. And Vayishma Yisro and Yisro heard about these things. And then he got up. Vayikach Yisro and he went. He took the family and they went. And then seven psukim later or so, Vayetze Moish Lukas Choisna Vayishtach Vayishak Levishali Shlevei Lushalom Vayavoha Elav Vaseid It was a nice Kabbalah Sponim. He welcomed him. And then Vayisapa Moish Lukasna Is Kola Shiloso Hashem Lepala Mitzrayim. The Moshe Benah told over the told over the Maisa. He told over what happened. Shvayim, Paro, the whole story. So Maral and Garaye, another Mefarshim, are asking, what changed over here? The Maisa, Yisro knew the entire story. And the Chlal, the Mefarshim, are asking, why did he have to come to join Ibn Yisro? So if it's a question of Gairus, of conversion, to begin with, what was the nature of Gairus at that time? This goes back to the question, of was it before Hasinai, after Hasinai? What was the nature of Gairus, of conversion at that time? And even if there was a need to have a Bezdin, or whatever that would have meant, and what kind of Kabbalah Samitzvah there would have been, but even if there would have been a Bezdin, certainly the Bezdin could have been sent to him. If it was a matter of his education, of studying, of having a program, like every Ger has a program, to study, to learn. I've had the schuss to be involved in that over the years many times. Chazal tell us that Yisro was a brilliant man. He had manuscripts of the Sefi Yitzira going back to Avram Avinu. He also had, you know, we know Chazal tell us that there was a Vesechta of Adazar that Avram Avinu that had 400 prokim. We don't understand what that was, what those prokim were about, what that Torah was of shame ve'ever, or that primordial Torah from before there was, the Torah that we, the way we understand it, but certainly Yisro was very learned. And if there were things that he needed to catch up on, there were no shortage, there was no shortage of qualified teachers that could have gone there to teach him. And if it was a matter of the family, he could have sent the family ahead. He didn't have to go himself. So why did he go? Why did he leave? Let's try to understand the nature of this bikush that the Rebbe is talking about in ourselves. And the Fabrengen of that Lubavitch said with little Mordechai what that was about and why it's so important that we're, that we're able to have this time together and, and that your Rabbanim here understand the significance of these Fabrangans and want to have them. I have a brother-in-law whose father was one of the great, great Lamdanim in the old Mir Yeshiva in Europe. His name was Rav Matl Rabinu, was Zechus He was a huge Talmud Chacham. In the earlier years, when he lived in Canada, he was Rosh Yeshiva there in Montreal. And then he spent the last 40 years or so in Yerushalayim. It was a huge Lamdan. And all of the, all of that royalty, that nobility of, of a Lithuanian Talmud Chacham he had. Whenever you spoke to him, he was always annoyed because nobody understood him, what he was trying to get across. So I remember when it was my brother-in-law's, this is a long time ago, it was his, I think his 40th birthday. And Ramotel and his wife, she should be well. Ramatul's not alive anymore for a very long time. He was almost 100 when he was nifted. Baruch Hashem. Rachel Rachel is. So they came in for the Lakavit, the son's 40th birthday in Flatbush. And 
and Ketoyev, Leiv HaMalach Bayayin, I decided that I would ask a model for a story. It was after he made a monumental speech, he was asked to speak, and I remember that he got up and he said, who covered his son's 40th birthday, he turned to my brother Nashleim and he said, you're 40 years old, Sof kol sof, what have you done your entire life? <laughs> what have you accomplished? Why are you having a birthday? Well, I don't even understand. So after, the, uh, that, that's the party sort of ended at that point. <laughs> and then afterwards I was talking to Rav Martel. And my daughter Suri is here and she remembers Rav Martel. And I, I asked him, I asked him, Rav Martel, you, you were by Rabbi Yeruchim. You know what I'm talking about, Rabbi Yeruchim? Rabbi Yeruchim, the Mashgiach, Rabbi Yeruchim, the Vav, it's the Echad Sadiq of Kaddish, the Vav. Rabbi Yeruchim died a long time ago, quite a few years before the Baham. And Rabbi Martel was already a, a grown person. So I asked Rabbi Martel, can you tell me something about Rabbi Yeruchim? So right away he got very annoyed with me. He said, oh, Shaim, you want a chassid jamas? I don't tell a I'm not a chassid. You go, go to some rabbi to get maizim. I said, I didn't ask for a chassid I asked you to talk to you about your rabbi. Tell me something about your rabbi. What does that do with chassidus? So he was quiet and his eyes got red. And then he said to me the following, he was very emotional and he was holding my coat. And he said, do you know what a pickle is? I said, yeah. He said, I don't mean the ones that they have in the stores. Did you ever, do you know how they make pickles? So I said, yes, my mother, my mother used to make her own pickles with the cucumbers and putting it into the grinder and she made them. That's what, that's what happened by Rabbi Yuchim. I said, what? He said, Rabbi Yuchim pickled us. And he was shaking and he said, Rabbi Yuchim pickled us. Ever since Rabbi Yuchim, he says to me, Mesha, not Mesha, 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 ever since Rabbi Yuchim, I can't look at the world anymore in a silly way. I can't look at my life as being meaningless. I can't enjoy certain pleasures that other people enjoy in the world. And it's not just me, it's the rest of us. From those lions that were part of that group. He said, Rabbi Yuchim did something to us, he pickled us. And then he looked over me and he walked away. Over the years, I've thought about that thousands of times. And I've cried out, I'm telling you sincerely to Hashem, thousands and thousands of times, I'm begging you, please pickle me. I don't have Rabbi Yuchim. I was urged to have great Rebbeim. They're already long ago, they went to the world of truth. One of my Rebbeim, who I was like to have, you all heard of Rabbi Yosheb Bias Olavechik, Zechit Sarek Levach. And the Rav said, and in his Mishpacha in Brisk, there were, the Tzadikim in Brisk said this, which I've mentioned many times over the years. But it's really quite remarkable. In Erevin, Daphne Dalad, where they were told, Kate said, Say the Mishnah. We're told how Moshe Rabbeinu taught Torah to the Jewish people. He reviewed it with Aaron, with the sons. And ultimately, everybody reviewed four times, as you know. So, Bryce and Erevin. That's, we live because of that. That's how we live. That's how Torah Shwalta. That's how. That's, that's how it works. That's how it started. That's how it goes. So when that case said, say the Mishnah, the Rav explained. 
the Rav said that it's interesting that there is a very, very important Jew who's missing from the Seder Mishnah. And it cannot be that he, like, he was out with uh, COVID or something. He was, he's missing. Who's that? No? Who's missing over there? Who is his closest talented? Hever. Yeshua. Yeshua was his closest talmud. It says entirely, Marsh. He never left the tent. But Yeshua's name is not in the Seder Mishnah. Yeshua was, was the greatest talmud chacham. He was the one who was most connected to Moshe Rabbeinu's Torah. Nevertheless, he's not in that Seder Mishnah. But every one of us opens up the Seder. You don't have to even open up the Mishnahis because it's printed in every Seder pick of others. Men, women, children. And we begin, we say the words, Moshe Kibbal Torah Mishinai, Umisaru Yeshua, and so on. So the Rav asked, what's going on? In Erevin, he's missing Yeshua from Ketzer Seder Mishnah, from the Seder of Teresh Peh. And yet, in Pirkei Avis, is Moshe Kibbal Torah Mishnah, 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 Yeshua? He's the man. So the Rav explained, I'm sure many of you have heard this. The Rav explained it doesn't say Moshe Kibbal Torah Misinai Vilamda Yeshua. It doesn't say that Moshe Benu received the Torah or was or learned the Torah and he taught it to Yeshua. It said that he received the Torah and he gave it over to Yeshua. And the Rav said there's a very big difference. In Erevin, there the Gemara is talking about the curriculum, the material of Yiddishkeit. And we have to have very, very good teachers who know the material and prepare the material with all kinds of good stuff to give, to give over those lessons of Torah. We depend on them, those teachers. We have some all-stars that are growing up here in the community, future teachers. We need them, desperately. But Yeshua, Yeshua, and Yeshua knew all that material. He knew all of that. But Yeshua was something else. I was talking with a couple of the Hever, right before he was talking to some of the Hever. And one of the, and one of the Heverim asked, could I say something about my father's Echelon Lefracha? Yesterday was my father's yard site, his second year. And I know many of the people who know me know that my father was a survivor of Mauthausen, and he was an extraordinary person. Could I say that my father, when I was growing up, taught me so much Torah? Not as much as I, as I, taught, my, as I taught my own son. My own son, I sat down, and I made him crazy. We went through Mazechte after Mazechte. Before his bar mitzvah, I'm talking about when he was already like nine, ten years old, because I was determined he was going to be the next Rav Moshe Weinstein. Baruch Hashem is wonderful, but there aren't too many Rav Moshe's out there. And my father didn't have the time, even though he, he learned a lot before the war. He came home very, very late. He was working very hard in those years. So I can't say that my father taught me Torah the way that I taught my son Torah. But you asked me, I think it was Ari that asked me for a story. But I could tell you that my, my father, Zechran Levracha, gave over to me Yiddishkeit. It doesn't say, the Lamda Yeshua. It says, Maisha Kibbal Torah Misina, he received it from Sinai. You see, Yeshua was pickled by Moshe Rabbeinu. And 
I was, I was pickled by my father. I can't think differently. As much as I try very often to think differently, I, I also was pickled by my father. The Gemara Baruch is Zion. The Gemara says that being in the presence of Torah greatness and even serving or taking care of the needs, the Shimush of a Talmud Chacham is it's greater than even the curriculum. Receiving from the Tzavik, being pickled by the Tzavik, Absorbing the, tza- the tzaddik. I have told many times that my Rebbe Mufak really was Rabbi Dover Lipschitz, Sheikh I don't know if you heard of him, was, uh, in East Kaddish. And I was very dovuk to him, and I used to drive him and take him. And once I was taking him to bake matzahs, and we were on the FDR drive. And he said to me, he asked me to say over a something in Chesidus, even though it wasn't his Mahalach, but he, he loved to learn. He, he was also by Rabbi Yuchan. So he asked me to say, so I, so I started to say, over, I was driving, and I started to say to him something from the Avni Nezer. And he said to me, get off the highway right away. He was like upset with me. I don't know what happened. I thought it was a good fart. <laughs> he said, get off the highway. So I waited for the next exit, and I got off, and I went to the first street, and I pulled over, and I said, Rebbe, what is it? He said, say, and I said over the tariff from Avneza, and then he said, no, and he grabbed me, we went outside the car, and we did a record over there, he did a dance with me. This is not a chesedish He did a dance with me on the sidewalk with people walking by. That five, ten minutes on the sidewalk by the FDR Drive changed my life in more ways than many of the shiurim that I can remember some, but there are many that I can't remember of the shiurim that I heard from Rav David. You see, Yeshua, of course Yeshua was teaching Torah every minute of his life. When it says in the Gemara that the shimush of Torah is Yosemili Muda, The Mars Chayis says, oh, 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 by the way, in the back, you look at the Mars Chayis. The Mars Chayis says, because the Gemara brings the Pusik about Elisha, it says that Elisha poured the water over the hands of his Rebbe, Elio. And, and the Mars Chayis says that what that Gemara is telling us is that the way that the way that Elisha understood the Indian of Natil Siadaim was not because he just heard the halachas, the class, but because he was there when Eliyahu Hanavi washed his hands. I saw, I was holding the water. I saw Eliyahu's hands. I saw him make the bracha. G'dali shimusha yosem limuda. There was a tzaddik who was by the Balsham Tov HaKadosh. He's one of the Mekurovim to the Balsham Tov HaKadosh. He's not as well known. He was a very, very hidden person. We know very little about him. We have Yudha Lei from Austria. His son was Rav Yebi. Some of you might have heard of Rav Yebi. So his, he was really much more famous. But the father of Yudha Lei was a big, big, big tzaddik. And we don't have Torah from him. There are a few a few sentences here and there that are found in this form from Harava Kodesh of Yudalei from Austria. And I saw once in a sefer that this Rabbi Yudalei was a Mayan and was Gabra of Torah. On Shabbos for hours there was Torah. Hours, Yontav, Mishchaydish Torah. 
but he didn't write anything. And one year, one year there was a there was a very very talented and ambitious chassid, also had such a head, like Rabbi Yoel, that kind of a head to photographic memory. And after Shabbos, after Shabbos, he would write down the Torahs. After Yontif, he wrote down the Torahs. And he did one year of Torah. And this one year, it says in the Sefer, I read this, was a huge bichla book of papers. One year of Torah from Rebbe Leib, Like this. And, and he was scared. But he went to the rabbi and he presented this to the rabbi, this year of Torah that he wrote over, which is the, the dream of every, of every teacher of Torah that, that his Torah should, should be able to get into the world. And Rabbi Hudalib sat with, his, with the pages and he was going over the pages. He had almost like a head like that, you know. And he... He didn't see really didn't say anything. And the chassid was crestfallen. He was devastated. He was sure that the, that the rebel was going to be so excited, so thrilled. And, and the chassid says, Rebbe, is there something that you saw that I didn't say over? I didn't write it correctly? I, I, I'm willing to do anything to, to, to edit, to fix it. If Rebbe could look at it and, and, and go over it more. So Rebbe Yudalib told him the following. Listen, do I still have you? I know I'm going, it's late already. A few more minutes. All right. So Rebbe Yudalib said to him, listen. You did a fantastic job. It's a good work what you did. And I, and I thank you for it. But I want to ask you something. Did you ever see a lumberjack in the, in the forest cutting down a tree? You ever see a lumberjack cutting down a tree? So the chassid said, yeah. That they, everybody saw it those years. That's all. I said, sure. You saw the lumberjack with the axe. And you saw him cutting the tree. Yeah. Tell me something. Did you ever see a painting of a lumberjack cutting down a tree? And he thought, he said, yeah, I've seen paintings like that. And the painting that you saw, is it the same as what you saw yourself, the lumberjack, cutting the tree? He said, yeah, it was a good painting. So the, the tzaddik said, Rabbi Yudalib said, when you saw the lumberjack, the lumberjack, when he picked up that heavy axe, whatever that big thing, he gave a crash. He said, oi, a Jew. He gave a crash. Oi, oi. For this one's panasa, for this one's shidduch. I hate, oh, he's this heavy. Oh, am I tired? Oh, am I poor? Oh, Rabbi Shalom, help me. And you heard that when he lifted up, it was with an eye, right? And then when he gave a clap to the, to the wood, to the tree, oh, you heard. So the chassid said, yeah. He said, but the oi is not in the painting. The oi is not in the painting. What you wrote, you wrote over the things that I said, and you did a beautiful job. The only thing that's missing is the oi. And I want you to know, the only way that I'm able to break open the hearts of those Jews who sit with me on Shabbos is not because of the words that I said, but because of the oi of how I say them. Because 
That's how they was pickling those Jews. And those Jews had hearts like a tree waiting to be smashed by the lumberjack. Why do you think Yisrael came to Moshe Rabbeinu? He's Mavakish. A Mavakish could have gotten Moshe Rabbeinu on Zoom or could have gotten him on, uh, on live stream. And the equivalent was of live stream in ancient times. Fine shluchim could have come. And Yeshua was, was able to do a fantastic shiurim also. He was a great magid shiur. The difference is that Yeshua was a Jew that knew how to scream in an oi. And he heard the oi of Moshe Rabbeinu. And giving over Yiddishkeit is not just a matter of teaching a good class. One of the chavri asked me, how do we raise children with Amuna? The world is crazy. It's a crazy world. How do we, how do we raise children? The answer is, we're not going to succeed if we just teach them Torah. We have to give them over Yiddishkeit. Umasarul Yeshua with an oi. I now understand there are people who are studying this. They call this now Kilo. There's a thing called Neo Hasidism. You heard about this? You heard about it? You know that we're, we're, we're in this movement. Did you know that? <laughs> in other words, in other words, from, there are Jews who are going to get a PhD thinking about me and you. Like a dissertation about us. Could you imagine that someone's going to write a dissertation about? about this Indian of bringing on a Tuesday night in Boca. Someone's writing this. They're already starting to come out with articles and books. People send me these things. I fold them up respectfully and put them away. I'm a Jew because of my father's eye. That's what I received from him. I can't, I can't, I've tried, and I told the Chaver before, I've tried with thousands of shiurim to explain my father's, I, I don't know, to find the words. But all I'm trying for these years is to somehow convey that oy of what it means to be a Jew, that oy of Yiddishkeit. That's not something Yisro could have read in a book. He was a genius, and he had ksavim, he had books. And he could have even gone onto the website, you know, maimadhasinai.com, whatever it was called. And I'm not saying that those things are not good, that people have the opportunity to be able to learn Torah that way. That's amazing, amazing. I meet people everywhere I go. It's amazing how people can learn Torah now. It's a gift from Hashem, and it should be used for that and only for holy things. But it's amazing. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm not disparaging that at all. It's an amazing tool. And Hashem should bench all the people that are doing that, uh, who are spreading Torah all over the world, that people are able to learn. If they were never able to learn things they couldn't learn in the past, it's unbelievable. But Yisro wasn't such a person that could be satisfied with, with the tape, with the Zoom, with the web, a website. Because he was a Mavakish. Because Yisro's heart was like a piece of wood. And he pulled open his shirt. And he pulled open his whatever robes they wore in those days. He pulled it open. And he bared his chest. And he said, tickle me. Break my heart. Take the axe and break open this heart that's so hard. Break it open. There's nothing that's holier than a a broken heart. Break open the heart. So what does it mean to write, to write a study of uh, the neo-Hasidic movement? What does it mean? When the whole mitzis is movement, the whole mitzis of a couple of chavra that are trying in different places to somehow to capture a little bit of that oy of Yiddishkeit, not to change anything in any halacha or any gemara, just the opposite. More and more and more. Kate said, say the Mishnah. More learning, more Torah, more gemara, more, more Rashi, more Taisvis, more learning. 
more halacha, more shulchan aruch, more tour, more rabba, more everything. But Rabbi Shalom, what happened to the oy of Yiddishkeit? I'm watching the chevra in the back. I, don't, I can't see you. I don't have my glasses on. So we have people here with dancing. Why weren't you dancing before? You're going to dance now. Where's the oy? Where's the oy in our Yiddishkeit? How do you teach that? Is there a way we can bring that back? I believe that there's a way, and it has to come through the Svar it has to come from Or Shiva Sayyam and from the Holy World of the Balsham Tov HaKadosh. That's how I believe. The, the, the Balsham Tov was sent, it's, ter, it's the Torah of Mashiach, it's the Kenu, it's Or Rishul Mashiach, because when Mashiach comes, he's going to run to the back of the room and grab every single one of you. He's not going to stand for it, because he's got the axe, you understand? He's got the big axe. He's going to make that lave heaven into a lave basa, basi raisi. He's going to take away, he's going to smash, he's going to break that, that, that stone heart that what Golas did to us. What all of the years of coldness, of emptiness, of hastaponim, of Hashem hiding from us, of people suffering, of Jews hurting, and of so much of a, of a history of misery and sorrows that have made us afraid to feel anymore the feeling of a Jew. When we hear that there's a tsar Lo something happens, that a Jew is hurt, the Jew is killed. The other day when we heard Masa Shabbos, we heard that there were Jews that were being held hostage in Texas. So then, then the oi comes right out, yeah? But our children are waiting, their hearts are, are, are their shirts are open, they're, they're waiting for us to hit them with an axe of Yiddishkeit, with the oy of Yiddishkeit. I don't know how to do that. I'm trying. Your rebellion here are trying. There are many wonderful Jews all over that are trying. The children have to see that. The children have to feel that. When Mashiach comes, it says in the Pasuk, Taira mi'iti teitze. Torah is going to come forth from me. And if that's a strange puzzle, what do you mean, we already, we already have the Torah? What does it mean, Torah me iti teitze? If that's strange, Chazal add to that a word that has caused us a lot of aggravation. Torah chadosha mi'iti teitze. A new Torah will come forth from me. You understand how that would cause a lot of problems, right? Like other religions got involved. Torah Chadosha, Anaya Torah. We're Jews, we believe at a Torah is like a It's a principle of our Emunah that this is the Torah, that it's never going to change. This is about Tosif, about Tigra. So what does it mean? Torah chadosha mi'iti teitze. A new Torah will come forth for me. So before we were singing the Badit Shiva Negin, you did a beautiful job, by the way. We were singing the Badit Shiva Negin. And in the Likutum and Kedusha Slavi, in two places, Kedusha Slavi talks about this new Torah. And Kedusha Slavi explains what Chazal tell us. That the Torah is written, Eish Shchira Al Gabi Eish Levana. When you open up a Sefer Torah, there are black letters. And they're beautiful. And it's, wit it's written, the letters are written on the white parchment. According to the Mukabalam, if you look in the Ramban and the Hagdama to the Torah, you'll see that all the Mukabalam talk about this. The Shlach the Shalat, and all the Tzadikim. The white spaces between the letters contain the deepest, deepest, deepest secrets of Torah. When it says in Shir Hashem, Yeshakenim and the Shikos Piyu, Hashem, we're waiting for you to kiss us again, Rashi says that Hashem didn't finish giving us the secrets of Torah. We're waiting for that second kiss. 
שיר השיר משקנים אנשים כבר הספיעו כי תאיבם די דרכה מיין. And according to the Mukabalim, he told him that that is referring to the white spaces. The black letters is the Torah that we have. The white letters, it's not a different Torah, Chas Rashon. Every single one of you here, you have friends, you have relatives. And each one of you has spoken many, many hours, have had conversations with people that you love. I was thinking about this yesterday about my father's yard sign, about the things that I wanted to say to my father but I never said to him. And I was always planning to talk to him and to say to him, but I just didn't. I was shy or immature. The things that I wanted to say and I didn't say. The things that we say are the black letters. The things that we want to say that come from the deepest place, of, the deepest part of who we are. That's called the white, the, the Levana, the white parchment. So the Ditchev has said, Torah Chadash Amiti Tetzi doesn't mean that there's going to be different letters. It means that we're going to then see the love that was behind all of those letters. We're going to feel that Oi of Hashem is Baruch. Moshe Lechaisnei is called Hashem Osa Hashem the Parlum at Shem Lord. This is so he tells the same story, but here it says Vayichad Yisro. Here Yisro was overwhelmed with joy, goosebumps, whatever. He was overwhelmed with joy. Vayichad Yisro. When he was reading the monarch notes, back in Midian or watching it on Zoom, it doesn't say Vayichad Yisro. When he was listening to some professor give a lecture about the nature of the mitzvah of loving Hashem, but that the professor never in his life felt a tremor of love for God in his heart, that wouldn't do it for Yisra. And it's not working for us either. All the, all the lectures are gewaldic. And they should continue. And we appreciate them. But we're waiting for the acts of Yehuda Leib, that Rabbi Yehuda Leib, come down on our hearts. Our children are waiting for it. And we're waiting for it. We're waiting for the Eish Levana, for the white, the secret of the white parchment. There's a story that I've told many, many times, and I'll end with this. And I, please be mindful if I took too much of your time. Everybody tells me that you're very laid back over here in Florida. <laughs> New York wouldn't, wouldn't have uh, tolerated any of this. Or maybe just like 15, 20 minutes, whatever. Anybody's looking at their things, looking at their things. But you seem to be okay. <laughs> Unless you're just very, very polite. This is one of my favorite stories. So, um, I say, you know, you could repeat over and over, so please be mindful of me also. Have you heard the story already? But it's a gewaldige maise. There were these two tzaddikim, Cheska Magid, Schusi Yelena, Rabbi Avram from Chirsk, and and Rabendel of Orca, who were best friends. And they grew up they were inseparable, but then it came time for them to separate. And each one had to go and to do, to start to build a Malchus of Yiddishkeit. So in the beginning, there was only uh, a forest that separated them. Each one was in a town uh, across from the forest. And they made an agreement with each other that every Arab Shabbos they would send a letter back and forth, from, Trisk, from the Triska Magi to the Mendel of Orca. They would send a letter. Of Yedidus, of friendship. What's going on? Ideas in Torah and so on. And they needed a volunteer who had agreed to deliver the letter back and forth from the Tzadikim, and there was a Jew. We'll just call him Yankel, whatever. And they see Yankel got the job, which very often took the entire Erev Shabbos and cut into his Parnassah quite a bit. Erev Shabbos is a busy day. But he faithfully for years went from Chiska Magid to Ramad Lavorka, and he would wait for Ramad Lavorka, would write a letter in response, and would deliver a letter back, and he went like this back and forth. Rots of Ashaif. So 
So once he was delivering the letter, you know, rain, snow, sleet, hail. Once he was delivering the letter, and he got a Yetzirah, you know, you always can justify, find some explanation. I'm doing this for so long, it's such mysterious nefesh, that I'm doing this, I, I, I'm entitled to see a little bit what the Tzaddik writes, you know. So, uh, so he did what you're not allowed to do, and he opened up the letter, from the Chiska Magid, he opened up the letter. And I'm sure many of you know the story, that throughout the letter, the paper was totally blank. It was a blank piece of paper. He couldn't believe it. What kind of a cruel game is this? That I, I, I give it my whole Erev Shabbos, my Parnassa, to run back and forth through the, with this mud and filth to deliver. He gives a blank piece of paper. This is what they do. He was so angry and hurt, but he had no choice. He went, he closed it, made it look good, and he delivered it to Remendler. Remendler Horka was so happy to see him. Yanko, oh, I was waiting for Yanko, Yanko. So he, he goes into the room, and Yanko's waiting for him like a half hour. And he, he comes out with an envelope, and he says, please, go in good health, and have a good Shabbos. Please give this to my friend, Rabbi Ramallah. So here, he just the second, like, he leaves the house, he opens this up. He doesn't wait for the forest. He leaves the house, and he says, what, I'd like to see how you answer the first letter. <laughs> <laughs> so he opens up this letter, totally blank. So he says, they're both crazy people, and, and I'm like a, a, a part of their game. So he went, he closed it up, and he went. He goes in there before Shabbos, and he, oh, your uncle's do. I was waiting for you to come back with a letter. Say, here's a letter. And he went. Shabbos, he didn't dive in the Bishop Magnus. He was diving somewhere else. He couldn't look at the, he couldn't look at the rabbi. He couldn't look at him. Not Friday night, not Shabbos. Mincha doesn't come to Shul. He's diving someplace else. What's the Shabbos? After Avdola, the Cheskavag, it says to his Gabba, go and, and, and get, get Yankel and bring him to me. He brought Yankel. Yankel can't even look at the Rebbe. And the Rebbe says, Yankel, what's wrong? He says, what's wrong, Rebbe? Rebbe, you don't know what's wrong. He says, what's wrong? Rebbe, you, you know, for whatever, five, six years, I'm going in the heat, in the snow, I'm going with letters. So he says, yeah, I appreciate it. I always, I always tell you how much I appreciate you. Yeah, but Rebbe, this time, I did, I did my very... Uh, I looked at your I looked at your letter. And they asked him, No. What, what do you mean no? There was nothing on the letter. It was blank. No. And then I went I went, of course, to Mandel and I gave him the letter. I don't know what he's sitting in the room, they're crying or something. I give him this letter and I, and I hear him crying and he's in the room and then he gives him another letter and and the Rebbe said, yeah, no. No. I looked at it right away the second I left his house. I looked at this, at this letter. Hey, no. No. It was the same like your letter. Nothing. He says, Rabbi, I'm just, I'm sorry, I can't dive in here anymore. I can't be here anymore. It's cruel. So the Rabbi said to him, listen, Yanko, you know what a safe attire looks like. You have black letters and his white parchment. And you know, Yanko, that the secrets of the white parchment are infinitely deeper because it tells us what the black letters, how every letter is a way of Hashem showing his love to us, which we don't see, we don't understand. So usually, I want you to know, most of the letters that you delivered back and forth had black letters and white parchment. But sometimes the longing is so great and the love is so strong between us that we can't write the black letters. We just send the white parchment. I had a Talmud that was learning Yerushalayim back in the days when letters were written. And I hadn't received a letter from him for a while. Finally, I got a letter and I opened it up. I was excited. It just said on the bottom, love Shmuel. It was blank. Of the story, he heard the story. He just wrote Love Shmuel. 
these are the letters that our children have to get. I don't, is there anything else I could say about this? These are the letters that our wives are waiting to receive from us, the husbands, and the husbands from the wives. When the children go to yeshiva, they're excited to hear the say the Mishnah. They want to see all the black letters. They love learning. Kids love learning. But the chalishing, the, the chalishing for the, for the white parchment, if you want to call that neo-Hasidism, call it anything you like, I prefer to call it shir shir. I want to give each and every one of you a bracha. To fabreng with other Jews. When Zalman Moshe Yitzchaki sat down with little Mordechai, the eight-year-old boy, and had two cups of vodka, and he made a couple of l'chaims, and he said, I couldn't really understand the Enod Mulvado unless I fabreng together with another Jew. It's because, not because Rabbi Zalman Moshe was missing the black letters. He had to sit with another Jew who he loves so that he could feel the white letters entering. He could feel the white letters surrounding the words, Ain Od Mulvado. That's what it means for Jews to Fabreng. I give you a bracha that your homes, that your lives should be filled with Fabrengans, that your lives should be filled not only with the wonderful black letters of Tarish Sav and Tarish Peh, but should be filled with the white letters, the white parchment. Until that day, that we'll be zeichet to do a dance with Mashiach Tzikainu, by the Gula Shema Amitish, and maybe Amen or Amen. Amen.
Marv on the right side. Marv over here. Marv over here in one minute. Marv over here. 